Do I need to make this guy? Okay. I'm going to start this way. I might end up behind the podium, but thank you everybody so much for coming today. Um, the end to die. I mean, that's why I was asked to give this talk, right? I work at a cemetery. Um, I'm responsible for over 30,000 dead people. Um, and so um, when I was first asked to do this, I, you know, it's like, do I need to make this about, like, really about death? And I'm not a very dark person, even though I work in a cemetery. And so I went through many phases of this talk, and you'll see what, where, we, where we ended up. Um, so the Woodlands Cemetery, how many of you have been to the Woodlands? Great, and there are some familiar faces in the audience, some people that are very active at the Woodlands, so thank you guys for coming. Um, so the Woodlands um, is uh, a cemetery in West Philadelphia, it's also a lot more, as you're going to learn today. Um, it is 54 acres, this is a, a drone shot of the woodlands that you'll see here. Um, that's the Schuylkill River in the background, University of the Sciences just to the west, um, and it is the largest open space by a pretty significant amount in this part of West Philadelphia. We are open from dawn to dusk for visitors to come enjoy the space. There's a running path, we do lots of programs and, and events, and we are also still an active cemetery. It is also a National Historic Landmark District. Okay, we're gonna go back in time a little bit here. Um, I'm gonna do abbreviated history. I know history isn't everybody's thing, but I think it is a really important part of understanding what we do at the Woodlands today and the different starts and ends that the site has had over time. The site has been reinvented. I would say we are in our third reinvention in its history right now. Um, so we're gonna start with the first reinvention. In 1745, this man, William Hamilton, is born. Um, he is born into a wealthy Philadelphia family. His grandfather is Andrew Hamilton, the famed lawyer. And as a two-year-old, William's father dies, and he is going, knows he's going to be the inheritor of over 350 acres of land along the Schuylkill River. 1770, he finishes building his first version of a home on that property. He, over time, inherits an additional 250 acres, making his total land holding in that part of town 600 acres. And he makes it his life's work to create the woodlands. Um, it was also known at the, as the woodlands at that point in time. This is the Hamilton Mansion that you see from across the river. Uh, it's considered the first federal architecture in North America. Um, an extremely significant building. It inspired other buildings such as the White House, um, the Oval Rooms. This room has several Oval Rooms in it. Um, here's another view of it, also from the Riverside. And his greatest achievement, in his mind at least, uh, was his greenhouse. He had over 9,000 plant specimens. He was a plant collector. And the core 90 acres of the property, he created what he called his park garden. Uh, everything was cultivated, everything was planned, and he introduced numerous tree and plant species to North America on the property. Thomas Jefferson thought highly of it, um, specifically the landscape. Um, Thomas Jefferson sends William Hamilton seeds from the Lewis and Clark expedition to plant at the woodlands and cultivate at the woodlands because he was so well thought of in the botany and plant world of the 18th century. And in 1813, William Hamilton dies. He dies a bachelor. Um, he, uh, as you can see from his obituary, I thought what better talk to put an obituary in than one about the end. Um, but the part of this obituary that I think is uh, great is the study of botany was the principal amusement of his life. And it really shows when you get deep into the history, it is what his passion was, it is what he cared about. And after he dies, um, because he has no direct heirs, the land, the 600 acres of land, starts to be sold off in parcels. Um, but it was an extremely well-known place in Philadelphia. It was one of the most important and significant pieces of domestic architecture in the country. And everyone here at that point in time knew it, even though it's kind of fallen by the wayside in the history books. So in 1840, um, a group of men led by Eli K. Price um, gets together 
uh, pools their money and decides that they want to try something new with this important property. We're along the Schuylkill River, um, industrialization is happening, um, and uh, we have this group of men that understands that this is an extremely important part of our history and that they could also make this into a business venture by starting the Woodland Cemetery Company of Philadelphia on the property. This was at the height of the rural landscape cemetery movement. Um, meandering pathways, beautiful, gorgeous trees were all a part of that movement, so they had a really great start with the Hamilton remnants of the Hamilton Gardens. Uh, the cemetery company was very uh, thoughtful in that they, I mean, I, as a preservationist, I really appreciate that this was clearly, in addition to a business venture, an early preservation effort. It was an early adaptive reuse of a large amount of property um, for a new purpose that could still kind of look back on the past era and, and see, it, uh, see it through, um, but also starting something new. So here's that same house. This is one of the earlier photographs we have of the building. You can see that the cemetery company makes some serious landscape changes. We have the Victorian aesthetic uh, really starting to happen here. We have uh, lots and lots of plants, overgrown plants. They look overgrown, but they were intended to be that way. And this building gets repurposed to be the business office for the cemetery. But they also transition the central part of the property into a funeral chapel. And it's thought to be one of the earliest funeral parlors in the country. So they put stained glass in, and we still have some of that stained glass um, on the property today. Famous people start getting buried there. Families would come and they would garden the graves of their deceased loved ones. This is the Eshrick uh, family gravesite. Wharton Eshrick is not buried there, but the rest of his family is. Other famous residents of note, Thomas Aikens, Samuel Gross, the Drexel Mausoleum, so the list goes on and on. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna jump way forward. The 20th century is not particularly good to the woodlands, especially the last half of the 20th century. Um, lots of things happen in the cemetery business world, all, all kinds of things happen. So 2011 is when I started working at the woodlands. Um, and I was a bright-eyed 33-year-old at the time, um, and I think back to that, and I kind of think, what did I think I was doing? But anyway, um, so my background, um, a little more deeply, I have a degree in historic preservation. I consider myself a building person. Um, when I was 20 years old in school, I started an internship at Colonial Park Cemetery in Savannah, Georgia, where I was going to school at the time. Um, and my first kind of hands-on preservation projects were repairing headstones. Um, I really loved it. When I first got into preservation, I was very hands-on. I was a very tactile preservationist, wanted to work with stuff with my hands. So the person, when I graduated, the person who I was working with there hired me, and I traveled around the southeast United States working on cemeteries. Um, and we worked at the Madison Family Cemetery at Montpelier. We restored the James Madison Monument. So some really important things. Um, little time goes on, I decide to move to Philadelphia. Move to Philadelphia, start working in Fairmount Park um, for the Fairmount Park Historic Preservation Trust, which is now merged with the Fairmount Park Conservancy, but primarily worked on the historic mansions and sculpture within the park system. So I had exposure to so many historic sites through that work. And I was there for 10 years. Um, and while I was there, we also worked at the Christ Church Burial Ground, which is just down Arch Street, um, and restored over 100 grave markers to get that site ready to be reopened to the public. So I had all this exposure to cemeteries. Um, I also lived in West Philadelphia, about 10 blocks away from the woodlands. So it's a place that I would frequent um, back when I did things like train for the Broad Street Run. It was the place I went. Um, I should do that again. Um, so uh, I would go running there and I would just imagine all of the potential of this place. And it was a place you would go to and barely anybody was there but it had all of these amazing things that you could imagine having life brought to. So this is a, a picture 
of the front entry sign when I started working there, um, which I thought this group in particular, being designers and such, would probably appreciate. Um, we have a lot of mixed messages going on here. We also have some misspellings. Can anybody uh, catch the misspelling? So, yes. So, I've got a little prop here. Um, so the first thing that I did, we had no money. I mean, it's probably why they hired me. They were like, what are we gonna do? We, let's hire this, this person who seems enthusiastic, maybe in over her head, um, but we might as well give it a try. So we had no money. Uh, we, uh, first thing I decided we needed to do is make the front entrance more welcoming. When I told people that I got this job, that all of these friends of mine in Westfully were like, hey, uh, I go running there, is it, is it cool that I go running there? Like, is that okay? And so I realized there was a lot of misconception about what was allowed, what wasn't allowed. Um, so we, we uh, made a new sign. We threw the other one in the dumpster. <laughs> and we have a really amazing volunteer at the Woodlands who thought it would be really funny if he pulled that sign out of the dumpster and made me a desk ornament. <laughs> so, um, so he showed up one day. And I keep this in my office to remind myself of how far we've come on those bad days. Okay, so this is that mansion. Oh, this, when I look at this, I think, oh my gosh, what was I thinking? So, um, so the mansion looked more like a haunted mansion. Um, it needed millions of dollars of work. Um, the front steps were falling off of it. Um, there were wooden pieces missing, there were, were leaks in the roof, which we still have a couple of that keep popping up. But um, So the next thing I felt we needed to do in order to do public programming, improve our appearance, was to raise money for the mansion. So this is the mansion today. Um, this, is, uh, this work was done between 2011 and 2015. We had to raise a few million dollars, a lot of hard work. A lot of study went into making this a more lively place. Um, and we really need it to be a lively place because we need to host events and private events in order to generate revenue so we can continue on for another 200 years. Here's the other side of the mansion. And this uh, is an article from 2015 that Ashley Hahn wrote. And she, this article actually came out in Plan Philly on the day of our benefit that year. Um, and we had just finished the mansion restoration, and it was one of the biggest kind of boosters and compliments that I could have ever imagined getting, especially since in the world of preservation and historic house museums, it is, uh, it is very hard to get this kind of a compliment. Okay, so, um, I'm gonna go back to kind of right when I started again. Uh, I'm a building person, right? And I've got these build I can take care of these monuments. I can raise money and know how to restore this building. But what I realized within the first two weeks of working there is I also have a thousand trees to take care of. And many of them are state champion trees. And the more I learned, the more significant that I realized that the tree canopy at the Woodlands was. We have some trees that date back to William Hamilton. We had multiple state champion trees, lots of, when I started working there, there were a lot of people from the tree world that were reaching out to me saying like, hey, I really hope you can highlight some of the trees there. They haven't really you know, been in the public eye, but they should be. So it was a bit of a, um, an, an awakening for me. Uh, I needed to learn about trees. So I signed up for a tree tenders course at PHS, tried to make connections with tree people that could be resources for, for us as a site. This image here um, is, um, I'm going to kind of start talking about some of our programs um, now. And this image here, I think, is a really good um, example of cemeteries and the life that they continue to provide. The tree on the right-hand side of the screen is um, a tree that William Hamilton planted. Uh, during his time. It's a tree that he introduced to North America at the Woodlands. It's called a Zelkova carpinifolia. It's, uh, it, that's its Latin name, Fastigiated Caucasian. Zelkova is its common name. And um, that is a picture taken in the early 20th century. Um, and it is dead in that picture. Um, what's cool about it is because the monuments still exist, we know exactly where that tree was. 
Um, and along with that picture, there's a notation that says that there is a small sapling that looks to be about 10 years old um, across from the Hamilton mansion. The tree on the left is that tree, and we know from that writing that that tree, which is the largest of its species in the state, grew from a root sucker of the dead trees. So we have new life coming from dead tree, and we are continuing, and we know that this is from the rootstock of a tree that was planted by William Hamilton in the 18th century at the Woodlands. Okay, so lots of important trees. So this is the canopy of a group of seven elm trees, um, three of which were state champions. Almost every elm tree in this country died of Dutch elm disease, um, but these seven trees didn't. And so it was like, people would come from all over the place to see these trees. Tree people would come and they, you know, it was called the, it was called the Grove of Seven Giants. And I always say it's like a cathedral for tree people. Tree people would come and they would just be in absolute awe of these trees. Um, magical, magical part of the site. Okay, so one spring, I guess it was spring of 2014, um, one of our regular visitors in the spring said, I, there's some flagging leaves on one of those elm trees. I think, I think we should get it checked out. And I thought, oh my gosh, there is. And it had just started to leave out. And so we had samples sent off and two of the trees had Dutch elm disease. And I called every plant tree person that I had contacted, got opinions and, you know, tried everything I could do. And we decided to cut the three down that were showing symptoms. Um, to try to save the other four. So we're gonna sacrifice these three. There's really nothing we can do about it. We have to try to save these other trees. We, we do that. And my friend Nicole at the time was a plant person. I talked to her and I was like, oh my gosh, what? Like, there has to be something we can do. There just has to be something we can do. Because I'm a building person. If you have enough money, you can throw enough money at a building. And she was like, trees are living things. All living things eventually die. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, you know, this is thinking I must be missing something. So these four remaining trees, we, um, it, it looked like a medical procedure. We injected them with stuff to try to prevent them from getting Dutch elm disease. Um, we did everything we could with the four remaining trees, but the next spring came, they were dead. Um, so, what do you do at a cemetery but have a funeral for the trees? Uh, so we realized it was March and we realized that our lawnmowers were coming back. It wasn't a super safe area of the site because they were dead trees. We didn't want tree limbs to fall on people and we needed to take them down. So with about four days notice, we realized the trees were coming down and that the general public that wasn't really aware that all this was happening was probably gonna freak out. Like what, why are they cutting down those trees? So uh, we felt we needed to do something. So I wrote this obituary for the seven giants. And uh, we had a tree funeral. WHYY ended up coming and doing a story on it. Um, and we decided to leave the remnants of the four trees in the landscape. Um, we know that there was an elm grove in that landscape that dated back to the Hamilton era. And so we felt like it was almost a memorial for the trees leaving leaving the stumps there. Um, also a habitat for wildlife um, and kind of bringing other life to the site. We got a sheet cake. Um, we had a guest book. We had little cards and we had um, kind of a program and all of these people that loved these trees at the very last minute were asked if they would be willing to come and speak about these trees and they all did. And it was really like one of the most kind of quickly thrown together but meaningful things I think that we have done at the Woodlands. We had about 70 people come. Um, we strung the trees with ribbon and people could tie ribbons to the trees. And we used all the wood that we could from the trees. We milled it and we're gonna be using it throughout the property so that we can kind of make use of that elm wood wherever we can on site. Um, once again, that little arrow points to a tree that is growing from the roots of the elm tree. So we have about a, it's about 12 feet tall right now, uh, about a 12 foot tall English elm tree 
that grew directly from those suckers that were kind of babying along and hoping that it, hoping that it makes it. So kind of another example of thriving. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears for a minute here. Um, one of the things once we, once we started having a mansion building that looked good and started doing all these programs, we've had a lot of interest in particular from artists that want to use the site, show at the site. And this is our most recent kind of biggest scale um, art occurrence that has happened at the Woodlands. Um, past present projects, which I know Heather was maybe gonna be here, I don't know if she is, but Heather Mokhtadari at past present projects um, came to us and had this idea to work with these two artists, um, Roberto Lugo and Leo Tukoski. And um, using some historic graffiti on the mansion that we found when we were restoring it as a jumping off point. Both of these artists started their careers in the graffiti world, and they are now both fairly well-known artists, and so kind of using that as the jumping point for their work that they were gonna create that would be site-specific. Um, what was really interesting about the project is that both artists kind of on their own ended up uh, doing something that related to memory or memorial. Um, Leo is a glass artist, and his grandmother, who collected depression glass, which obviously had a big impact on him, he is now a glass artist, um, she died during the beginning of beginning phases and conversations of this project. She particularly collected amethyst depression glass, and this is his work hanging in the windows. Um, so it was very much a tribute to his grandmother, but also he is kind of keeping her legacy alive through his work. Um, and, and her impact on him is absolutely obvious through the work that he creates. And Leo is the artist on the left here. Um, Roberto is the artist on the right. Um, and he is amazing. I recommend he um, teaches at Temple. Um, and he is local and does absolutely amazing work. Um, and this work is obviously extremely, um, really makes you think. Uh, Roberto decided to do this after seeing a picture of Michael Brown's uh, high school graduation picture and realizing that it looked exactly like his high school graduation picture. And so he created this urn, and a thinking cemetery urn, and the height of the urn, the shoulder height, his shoulder height is exactly the shoulder height of this urn. And he put Michael Brown's graduation picture on one side and his own graduation picture on the other side. And he created this cast resin uh, sculpture of himself that faced that urn. Um, and it was in the space with the cemetery around it, a really kind of powerful, powerful room to stand in. Um, while that project was going on, City Lab uh, did a national article on the new art galleries, urban cemeteries. And it is, uh, cemeteries are peaceful places. They are also places that make you think about things that you don't always think about in your everyday busy lives. Um, and I think that there's something to be said for the inspiration that artists can get from cemeteries, and historically, they had monuments in them. Monument makers, stone carvers, that's where they were working in the 19th century. So there's also, you're surrounded by monuments. So, I'm gonna talk about one more project, um, which is probably our most well-known. Um, I'm gonna talk about the Grave Gardeners. How many of you have heard about the Grave Gardeners? I think we have a couple of grave gardeners here. Grave gardeners that are here, would you stand? One grave gardener. One grave gardener was here. I think he had to leave. So, um, so this image here is from a historic guidebook of Philadelphia describing the woodlands in the 19th century. Um, the woodlands was particularly known for having a lot of this style of headstone. Tombs in the French style, they're called here. We also call them cradle graves. Um, they're also called bedstead graves because they have a head and a foot and sides and it's like laying in a bed and going to sleep. And they were designed to be planters for family members to come and cultivate and plant 
as a way of healing, but cemeteries in the 19th century were also thought of as parks. So kind of planting space for families to come memorialize their family members um, through horticulture. So we decided um, in January 2016, uh, after having thought about it for a long time, we didn't have a lot going on in January, and we thought, let's, let's throw this idea out into the world and see if we can get maybe 20 people that are willing to garden these graves. And we put an application out. We wanted to make sure we got people that uh, were committed and that understood that this was a commitment they were making. We didn't, you know, just want people to come and kind of fall off, fall off to the side. We wanted them to really understand that we had expectations. So in the application, we asked, like, why do you want to do this? And, you know, we thought we'd get, I really want to learn to grow flowers. And we got some of those. We also got some, like, my grandmother just died, and I think this would really help me deal with that. And she lived in, you know, North Dakota or wherever. So we got this whole range of reasons, and we got 75 people applying in about a 14-day time period without doing much advertising at all. So we didn't really have the funding for it, but we said, well, let's just accept them all and we'll wing it and see what happens. So each uh, gardener is given a grave of a person, um, and we do a bunch of um, education um, at the front end. Uh, making sure they understand the history of the site, the significance of the place in horticulture. Um, we also have a preferred plant list that's mostly plants that would have been available in the 19th century, just so that we're kind of keeping with the aesthetic of the place. Um, and we do some beginning horticulture planting, how to plant flowers sort of thing. This is a video, which is not gonna have sound. However, I'm gonna play it and talk about it. Um, no, nah, it's not. Um, so this is Lily, um, and she uh, is one of our gardeners. She's been with the program since the first year. Um, and uh, we had a person taking video the very first work day of the program. And so all of the video that you're, you're watching right now is from that first work day of the program. And Lily was being asked a series of questions. Um, and I would say the most uh, kind of pertinent to this conversation is she was asked what she was thinking about when she was digging. And it was kind of off the cuff. She was like, you know, I don't, I don't know. My family, you know, a lot of them were cremated. I know where their ashes were spread. My grandfather, he's, you know, I know where he's buried, but I've never visited a cemetery. I don't know if that cemetery even allows people to plant stuff there. Does anybody go visit? Does anybody plant anything? So it really has created this um, kind of deeper level of thinking that we weren't necessarily anticipating when we launched the program, but it's what has really made it special to me and has made it special for the site. Um, so, okay. This particular grave, um, which is now a garden, um, had iris planted in it historically. Um, and those iris spread over time. The tree behind this grave grew, um, so it shaded it out. And no one had split these iris for who knows how many years or decades. So on that very first planting day, we separated these iris that had been dormant for who knows how long. And we spread them throughout the whole site all gardeners took little pieces of them. And we now have this iris scattered throughout the whole cemetery. We did this at several different graves throughout the site, and this site in the springtime now is full of iris, iris that were there totally dormant um, until we started this program. Here's some more images of, of that work day, that very first work day. You can see all the barren barren graves, no flowers. It's also late March, so that plays a role here. So everything was resting, just waiting. And this is what it looks like now. Um, this particular one, you'll see there's a, a fern carved into the stone, and that gardener planted a fern behind it. Gardeners have been extremely thoughtful, done research on their person. Um, to kind of figure out what they think that they would have liked in their garden and plant it accordingly once they learn about them.
and it's really just transformed the site. And I'm gonna flip through these rather quickly. Okay, so this rose existed and it never, it continued to exist because it was out of, it was growing between these two stones um, and a weed whacker couldn't get to them. So it, it survived the 20th century. Um, the very last thing I want to talk about is one of our grave gardeners, Allison Williams, who uh, signed up for the program and she had pancreatic cancer. And we did not know she had pancreatic cancer until it got pretty bad last year. Um, and so she has pancreatic cancer, knows she's gonna die from it, is gardening the grave of a stranger who died 100 years ago. Um, I never talked to her about her reason. Like, I'm assuming it was many reasons. She lives in the neighborhood. So she died this past, I guess, late winter. Um, and the grave gardeners planted a rose in honor of Allison at the grave that she was tending. And her family bought a grave spot that her cremains will be buried in. And her daughter walks her dog at the woodlands all the time, um, which reminds her, I'm sure, of her mom. And um, it kind of keeps her legacy going. I was researching for doing this talk, and I was watching talks, and the talk on death that happened last year, I saw Allison in the audience on the online video this week when I was watching it. Um, so her story, I think, is kind of, from my perspective, what work makes this work meaningful, and it's important that's a historic place, but it's important that it be meaningful to people now, and the impact that these places can have and continue to have. Um, what I love about really old plants, um, heirloom plants, they're not related to each other, but they're, they're always plants that have this survival mechanism that most other plants don't have. So you have plants that can live with almost no intervention, no tending, no coddling, and they can live for 100 years, they can live for 200 years. And they're beautiful, and the fact that they're plants that were physically placed at graves um, at some point in time and the people who planted them are gone all memory of the people is gone but you still have this what is often a very fragile looking plant that is not fragile at all it's incredibly tough and has outlasted by generations the people that planted them so that's what I love about old-fashioned plants they usually smell good they're usually sort of small and delicate but they're just so pretty and so um, they're also plants that you can't really find anymore you have to go, you know, find them yourselves. <laughs> so um, my involvement with the project is that we had, you know, we talked about this last fall, Jessica and I, and we thought how great it would be to restore some of the horticulture that traditionally has been at the woodlands and was at the woodlands for 100 years before disappearing more recently, to reintroduce it back, to create an opportunity for people in the neighborhood to beautify their community asset, which is the woodlands, and um, then to kind of create some context of historically what graveyards like the woodlands would have looked like. They were filled with flowers. They were designed to be full of horticulture, and that is lost. I don't think there are any other cemeteries anywhere that I know of that have tried to reintroduce horticulture to the degree that we're doing here. To me, I am not a romantic person except when it comes to plants. And I think flowers in graveyards are the most romantic thing that I have ever heard of. It's like out of literature, it's out of poetry. It's this idea that um, people are remembered when, um, you know, after they're gone, of course you have the headstone, but to have something living that continues on after a person is gone, um, and it could, in many cases, could be a plant that they really loved when they were alive. And so it becomes another way, an additional way to remember a person who's gone. So you'll have a grave of a mother and then mother's favorite rose there that you could go visit and be reminded of her every time that you see it. So to me, that is just incredibly touching and moving. And it's probably why I got really interested in cemetery plants to begin with. So I guess the theme of this talk was end, and uh, you know, people die, we all die, all living things die, as that was actually my friend Nicole that 
told me that with the trees, but we also all endure in ways. Um, plants endure, we endure through the people we touch in our life. And so that's what I want to end with. Thank you all for coming today. Um, really appreciate it.